call to order of the uh, Preservation Board meeting of April 28, 2014. Uh, I'll do a roll call. Robinson, are you here? I think so. Commissioner Colleen? Here. Mr. Visitator? Present. Alderman Schmidt? Here. Mr. Wright? Present. Mr. Johnson? Here. Commissioner Fathom? I'm here. And our Chairman Richard Callow is absent this evening, so I will be subbing for him. Ready to go? Uh, well, first I'd like to uh, ask if there's any comments or changes to the agenda. A motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Yeah. Everybody in favor of that? Aye. Aye. And then did we... Do I have a motion on the minutes of our March 24, 2014 meeting? Okay. Any comments or discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, we're going to go out of order slightly here. We're going to uh, the first item we're going to do is item C, the preliminary review for 5010 to 32 Grandway Avenue. Not refer it to us. 
It's about 22 feet tall. And it's 50 to 12 gate bay, there'll be a duplicate on either end. The staff feels that while the scale of the monuments are substantial, so are buildings in the neighborhood, particularly along the school. We are representing a school. They haven't started construction on it, have they? They have started construction on the fountain. They have a building permit for that. Okay. So they're doing everything right. Any questions, commissioners? Thank you, Dean. Alder Ruben Howard? State your name, your address, and swear to tell the truth. My name is Alderman Carol Howard. I'm over at the 14th Ward, City of the 6th of St. Louis. I live at 5367 Gilson, and I swear I'm will tell the truth. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, in, in looking at this in context, uh, as many of you know, the Bosnian community has, has moved to St. Louis early in the 90s, and they were uh, they've become a, a vital part of the community in, in the area as well as in the 14th Ward. Um, they have taken it upon themselves to do the fundraising. This lot traditionally was uh, leased to the Grandma Business Association, and um, the Business Association is still going along. I can't say it's as healthy as it once was, but the Bosnian Chamber and uh, several other Bosnian organizations took this upon themselves to build this. The fountain is a replica of the Sebi fountain that is found in many communities in the Bosnian area that replicates the fountain. Back. The story is that if people were going to the Silk World on the east, that they, to the east, they would have these fountains for people to replenish their water supplies, and it was always given away as a, 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 a goodwill for travelers through their city. So they thought it appropriate as as well as the other members of the community that this be erected in, in as a place that signifies that the Bosnians call the 14th Ward in the Vigo area home. So uh, I think when you look at the context, they have raised the funding for this. They're um, doing it. Uh, they're doing it without any funding from the city of St. Louis. And uh, it's really bringing the community together, and I think it will be a, a, a point of interest for the 14th Ward, and, and as well as a place for people to gather and feel comfortable in the St. Louis area as Bosnian residents. Any questions for all the women, Howard? Thank you. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, that the Preservation Board recommend approval of the proposed city park project to the Board of Public Service. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. All. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call 1315 Golden Street. That was a long way back. Okay, new construction at 1315 Dolman. This is one of, I think, 8,000 new housing built on drains. So, um, we've met with uh, the architect and the owner who are here today. Um, they've changed their plan to meet the lot fit square standards, and they've been looking to work with. So, uh, let's close this really quickly. We've seen about, about 80 of them. So, that's the site. It's on the west side of Dolman, uh, just off Park Road. So that's all. Up next door, there'll be another new construction between there. That's the best definition right now, actually. The cross. Looking southwest towards the site. This is their model example they chose to go with. And the site plan. And the 
the agenda and had the um, side swap around and said he left, had a fun face in the alley. This is pretty wrong, but we're okay with that. He pointed that out. Thanks. Uh, but anyway, if it doesn't match the uh, I'll example, um, illustration is fine, doors are fine, forms are great. This is the size of the space, the uh, community garden, and towards the park. Uh, still work with the owner on um, some of the administrative duties, maybe on the side with the nearest the windows. But in overall, we're happy with the uh, middle and we'll please give you some know, details. The north side. Next slide. Okay. Um, going through real quickly, uh, it conforms with everything in terms of materials, administration, piece of model example, setbacks, fun, um, matches the height with the neighboring building. Um, so the window supply, everything does comply with the HP and the standards. So, um, based on working with the applicant, um, we recommend that the board grant preliminary approval to the proposal with the condition that design be developed as proposed. And that the design details be reviewed and approved by the cultural resource office. Good question. You had one comment in here that said it did not comply, and that was like the window placement on the. Oh, on that's on the uh, south side. We're going to still work with the owner on that, but I think we do have the middle room with you. Okay. I mean, they agreed to go kind of with this. They've been good so far, so I think we'll be okay. I was going to say that provision, it talks about proportion, it doesn't really talk about location. I'm just saying, you mean the nearest little bit of the cell you're referring to? Right, the way that the issue would look like about the location and how close it went to the front. Well, yeah, because I mean, if it's so close to the front, you know, that kind of takes away it being, you know, the, you know, like a, a load bearing wall. I mean, it's so close to the front like that, and you kind of move the idea that it's a, you know, load bearing wall and it's the near, kind of, of the near. So, um, that was an issue about placement. Again, we'll be good work with this. Okay. So, front of the thigh, second half, arched windows with those.
one suggests that three is potential for some type of commercial or office use to be at least modern. The area is undergoing upgrading, as mentioned in these criteria, and there is no reason to think that interest in real estate on the However, it is unlikely that historic tax credits would be available for the allocation of 4108, as listing this building individually in the National Register of Historic Sites would be a challenge. There are no current plans for districts along the National Register of Historic However, more latitude with interior changes would be possible if the rehabilitation was not a tax credit project. So, um, as we see with many other buildings in the city, the applicant has not provided any information concerning an economic hardship to the rehabilitation support. Service design is important for all of the civil guards. One of our major thoroughfares to those two several languages. A portion of Linda between Sarah and Whittier, which is the small historic district. Part of the small historic district is intact with seven state buildings in that portion of the Selman Campus, all but one of which were built during the Civil War in the century period. So this is kind of irregular, but fairly consistent spacing and the lot supporting the of the rest of the So, something to be avoided on the importance of the material. The proposed demolition would alter the character of the district in the street and the block. 4108 contributes to the mid century character of the block and local district. The merit building can be used to the street and provide context to some of the more perhaps architecturally interesting buildings on the street and supports the density, integrity, and red lines. So, we have a proposal for um, construction. Unfortunately, this project does not comply with the requirements of the 
specific direction for providing parking is by the Should demolition and new construction occur, that would trigger the use of the central informant regulating plan and standards. New parking lot would be considering new construction. In the introductory section of the form, there's a document saying parking facilities, the creation of a parking facility or the adoption of a parking facility is not permitted except in the city of Then we turn to the regulating plan and the standards for closing um, up the standards. 4108 is a boulevard type 1 area. Boulevard type one area flanks the boulevard and is intended to maintain and support additional development. The mid use high density area is one of the vibrant pedestrian oriented character and allows flexibility in use. Building high standards for boulevard type one areas are a minimum of three depth stories and a maximum of 12 stories. A variety of building types can be built and many uses One architectural standard pertains specifically to this project should demolition be approved and the parking lot structure, and that's the requirement for a proposed making the street wall that would be the wall in the street parking structure. DOG 4100 Local Partners LLC proposes a 23 space surface parking lot. 
and the project appears to meet the standards for an addition to the building. If you remember the site plan, there was uh, supposed to have a little drive through giving access to ATM machines. The location of this on the rear facade on a small scale means that the 70 standard design because we have every reason to believe. The other one is parking and curb cuts. So that's it. Standards say that no new curb cuts would be allowed. This plan presents um, 40M 108 without significant curb cuts. I get that one too here. Um, also, there is a requirement for screening parking. Um, I'm not sure that I would uh, limit the landscape here in the standards for screening. And they have to be pretty I think more serious are the curb cuts. Um, there's two new curb cuts proposed for Sarah. Oddly enough, this parking lot at the moment is accessed only by the flight. So the two two-lane curb cuts, which would significantly reduce the amount of sidewalk um, that's not crossed by a curb cut on Sarah. Okay. <laughs> Sarah is secondary street compared to Little Boulevard. It's not the case. New curb cuts considering the existing conditions, but four lanes um, seems to be um, quite a. I take it on the sidewalk, you have a crossfire curb cut, so they may, may need some further study. So, rather than go through my findings, which I think you have articulated already, I have offered two. Um, Here's the gateway, but the narrow gateway between the buildings is narrow than it is present. Here's the context opposite outside the local. So my two recommendations are considering the proposed demolition of 4108, it is recommended that the preservation board deny preliminary review if the criteria for demolition are not. And there appear to be alternatives for redeveloping the two parcels. Concerning the rehabilitation of 4100 Lindell, it is recommended that preliminary approval be expressed as a plan to rehabilitate the building with the condition that the applicants further study the layout of the parking lot and ATM facility at the point of entrance, as well as the screening of the function, be compliant with the standards for the rehabilitation. It is expected that the rehabilitation would be compliant with the standards of the project. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Any questions strictly about the form based code um, situation? Just to bring the form based code document if anyone wants to dip into that, but it's very familiar with it as far as possible. Do we have any correspondence from Alderman Rohde? We do not uh, hear from Park Central for we'll What has happened is in the review of the function. Okay, and anything from the neighborhood association or we have a speaker from them as well? Yes, yeah. And then, okay, uh, I had a question. So I thought last month we, when we were going through kind of protocol preliminary reviews, that we wanted people to go through their zoning process first. And is that because the form based code is unique for not having that here or? Well, uh, yes, that's a good point. It is the complication with the form based code is it's difficult to deal with the variances needed for a project until the project is in the more final design state to know what variances are needed. So it would be difficult to do that as a preliminary
for the warm-based chemist. So they're going to get a variance for that, I guess? Well, they would have to. Yeah, they're not meeting the architectural standards for the new construction of the Boulevard site. Okay. Um, but not the limit. So I know we're looking at all of this, but as I'm listening to you, what I'm hearing is that there's a sound merit with a minimum moderate reduce capability, um, and that um, it would interrupt the space of the area. Nevertheless, we look at the next step, which is um, what's proposed to be constructed for it to be demolished, and you're indicating that that doesn't comply with the or the code. Right. Yes, and in contrast to you know, the last project where we referred also to the department, so this is a final uh, front wind is not being 30 inches from the corner, for minor compared to the overall extent of the overall extent of which that proposed building met the forming code and is working. There is one other thing I want to point out is that we look back at the bike plan. And while we know parking is important, particularly for residential units, if it's in the footprint of the 4108 building, go back one more, you can see it does not extend to the rear of 4100. So the bank drive through and the seems like the Eagle Bank function of the building would be viable even if 4108 can be standing and there's a parking solution to that. And of course, if there was a proposal for new construction that met subsequent new construction, in other words, the three story building floor that included parking within the structure, that would be a different situation. Is there a parking lot immediately to the south of it? There is. Okay. Okay. Any further questions of Betsy? Okay. Uh, we can call the applicant up to see Smith and Greg Trost. Are we tag TV? Can you state your name, address, and support to tell the truth? Uh, Steve Smith, 319 North 4th Street. I swear to tell the truth. Greg Trost, 319 North 4th Street. I swear to tell the truth. So yes, I would agree this is complicated because um, there's multiple different uh, jurisdictions and things here. Uh, we were approached about nine months ago just to give a history of how this project came about by Eagle Bank. Um, Eagle Bank wanted to locate in the West End and they never developed in the city and they approached us to see if we could help them develop this property. Um, realizing that the last two proposals for this property were complete teardowns and it was a high rise proposed here when we started talking to the uh, to the housing authority that would clear the site and part of that of course the CDS, we knew this was going to be a challenging site to redevelop. So when we got involved, uh, the first thing we did was look into the cost of the building. Uh, the uh, 4100 building and it cost estimates on that. It's a it's somewhat of an expensive building to restore to its original condition, the exterior skin system, uh, basically replacing the entire exterior skin. So we looked into whether it was in a historic district and what qualified for tax credits and at the time, well, even today, it still does not. We reached out to SHPO um, to get their preliminary opinion, if you will, on the merit of each of the two buildings, 4100 and 4108 Wendell, and its ability to be listed on the National Register because we knew at this point that tax credits were going to be important to make it financially viable to happen. Um, we were directed that 4100 had a good chance of being listed. It was designed, it was an early design of Diwabata, and I think everyone would agree a, a great example of early mid-century architecture. Uh, but Schiphol also indicated to us, and I think uh, Betsy would concur, that uh, the 4108 building really would not merit 
uh, individual listing on the National Register, and so we were led to believe that that building would not be able to get to a position where it would qualify for tax credits. As we are here today, we uh, still are not listed in either building. We are uh, hoping that the 4100 Lindo building will get listed uh, sometime this year, and, and uh, that's going to be a key component for this to be viable and to move forward. So the next thing we did is looked at how, uh, if we redevelop this building, how does it comply with the code, the various codes, zoning. We met with Bob Lori at the city uh, because we had the drive-through. Where would the drive-through go? What would the drive-through look like? The curb cuts, the green space, how would it come, uh, fit with the farm-based code, and what kind of use. Uh, we explored redeveloping buildings 100% commercial. And we explored redeveloping the building, and I'm talking about 4100 right now primarily, uh, as a mixed use residential and commercial. And a lot of the, um, where we ended up with a mixed use was because of the parking demand of the commercial use from a market standpoint would put greater market pressure on where do you people park. So if the uh, existing building, which is 24,000 square feet, was all commercial, it would have one parking demand. If it was mixed use with the residential on top two floors, it would have a lower parking demand from a market rate standpoint. The 4108 building is 15,000 square feet, so in commercial or residential use, it would add to that parking demand. Then we started looking and trying to understand as best we could what the farm based code and the building code had to say about parking requirements. And it's still reaching out to Bob Lori, working with Betsy, we're still not 100% sure what the code requires for parking. This is a change of use as we envision it, going from a fully commercial building to a mixed use building. There is some debate. Does that therefore kick in the city, city's parking requirement? Uh, the city's parking requirement, we believe, is lower than the market requirement. Um, but uh, the city's uh, parking requirement would be one parking space for every apartment unit, dwelling unit. Just for note, our Park Pacific property, the reality is one and a half spaces for every unit. That's what the reality we're seeing at Park Pacific, another urban project. But here, um, uh, the requirement is only one per parking space. And then the ground floor, which we believe is mercantile retail, because our 100% of our ground space is committed, is committed for public use. Uh, it is one space for every 750 square feet over 3,000. So um, the point is, if the existing building stays, we need more parking. Uh, uh, we need more parking with less space, basically. Uh, there's a plan, which is, was not part of Betsy's presentation, because we developed it later, that tried to see how many spaces could we get on the site if the 4108 building stayed. And we should probably pass this. It's 11 spaces um, for, for us to be able to. So the plan that Greg's passing out uh, has 11 off street parking spaces for about 42,000 square feet, leaving the 4108 building there. We won't get financed, it won't happen. So it just won't happen. So we'll just, uh, you know. For those who develop real estate, we can't uh, borrow uh, six million dollars for the 4100 building and more for the 4108 building with only 11 off-street parking spaces. Furthermore, our concern would be uh, to the neighborhood around us; they'd be parking on West Pine. So um, across the street is a retail center with a lot of parking, but you know we don't, we're not allowed to park in their space for uh, apartment dwellers or for our retail users. To the east of us is an apartment complex that has a surface lot, but they're not going to let us park in their lot. So the only alternate spot would be to start filling into the neighborhood to the uh, south and, uh, and west of us. So based on that, we put our proposal together to um, to remove the 4108 building because the SHPO would not support it for historic tax credits. Our interpretation of the city's parking requirement is that the change of use would require us to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 33 parking spaces and leaving the existing building, there's no way for that to happen. So we're like, what code do we follow here? Uh, so the next thing we did then is after we put the plan together, as you see here, we approached the um, both the redevelopment, the Park Central redevelopment and the neighborhood group. So at the Park Central, we presented a plan similar to this one here that had a curb cut on the end over. Other than that, it was much, uh, pretty much similar to what you see here. 
and the Park Central Board, I think I would be correct in saying, uh, approve the plan with the one caveat being that we eliminate the curb cut on Wendell and create a screen wall of some kind of lock to lock from Wendell Boulevard, which is what we've done. We did what they asked. And then we uh, presented the plan as modified to the neighborhood organization, uh, who I think is represented here, and they also approved our plan as modified, as you see here shown. Uh, we also have a letter from St. Louis University uh, supporting the plan as well, as they are adjacent to us. So as we said here today, uh, we have uh, commercial users that will take the entire ground floor, um, and we believe that the apartments will lease uh, on the upper two floors if we have a modest amount of parking spaces, less than we have uh, at Park Pacific for the, re for the uh, residential. Um, and so and we believe it's a financeable project. Uh, a couple other notes here. I did want to point out that the existing parking situation that's, uh, that you get to on the south side of the property is paved 100%. There's no green space whatsoever. And I guess the housing authority, when they were in there, tandem parked, so they actually stacked cars where you couldn't get every space uh, by a lane. So our parking situation adds a fair amount of green space. We also are intending to uh, to enclose the parking with the city required um, edging uh, to parking uh, parking lot surface lots. Uh, we've eliminated curb cut as asked. And I guess the final note, uh, since it came up, is that uh, we are uh, going to board of adjustment on May 7th, since uh, you brought that question up regarding our, our zoning variances uh, that are required for this. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, I should mention, uh, you know, on having been designing, redeveloping historic buildings for 30 years, I think any building can be physically rebuilt and redeveloped. Um, I really do believe that with the right amount of money. Uh, the 41 weight building, interesting. Uh, uh, we've gone and rebuilt many, many buildings over the years that are in significant structural distress. The 41 weight building admittedly is not in structural distress, but I've never seen more mold growing in a building than I have in the 41 weight building. Uh, there's been standing water, I guess, for years in the basement uh, that has caused the humidity in the air. And it is, it is a building. I'm not comfortable going in because of the, the, the degree of mold that is growing on the interior walls of it. Not that that can't be fixed, but uh, it is in, in pretty bad shape. So, yeah, so we have a letter from SLU and we have some photos of the interior of the, the 4108 building. We have um, 
we've got detailed designs right now. We're, we're, we're comfortable on the financeability of this with a few, uh, you know, we need the tax credits and a few other things. Uh, we go to a bank as a partner. So, um, and everything's market rate. They're paying actually, I think, premium rents to be in this location. So, uh, but the historic tax credit is the thing that's going to drive the overall schedule at this point because we can't start without it. So that's November. But you're still thinking it'd be you can start within a year from now? Absolutely. And then when Betsy went through the criteria, um, there was no redevelopment plan. Are you going to be doing a redevelopment plan on this? Yeah, so we have our, uh, I think we have to go back to Park Central, understand the process, and that is next Tuesday as well to begin that process of creating a redevelopment plan. So by July, would that be? Well, that also is going to fall into the fall. Just, just a comment, it would be real helpful to us if we had a redevelopment plan because right now, we're um, sort of struggling based on the standards that we normally receive. Yeah, maybe we're out of, out of um, process here or timetable, and I, uh, I think because of um, not being familiar with farm-based code, this is the first time we've been we've done something in the West End. Um, you know, if we need to come back later, that would be understandable. Uh, we've tried to be as communicative as we can be with all affected parties and move the process along. Uh, so if we're ahead of ourselves in terms of this, then we would be happy to, to come back in the future if that's the appropriate thing to do. Any further questions? Thank you. Uh, Can you give us your name, address, and spread us on the truth? Uh, Brooks Gettiger, 4512 Manchester. I swear to tell the truth. Um, it, I'm Brooks Gettiger, Executive Director of Park Central Development. Um, we're the local development corporation for this part of the Central, Central West End. We administer what's called the Development Committee for the area. It's a representation of uh, 11 residents, um, institutional members, some property owners that are part of that committee. They were part of the group that really fought against this building being torn down and the CBS being put in its place. Um, and they are ecstatic to have this building be rehabbed. Um, so along with it, Park Central has come out into the community and we haven't heard anybody that would be upset for 4108 Lindell to be torn down. So everybody is very happy to have this HOK building um, rehabbed and restored, um, and it again to be a, a viable place in the neighborhood. Thank you. Any questions of Brooks? Ready? Thank you. Harold Carabell. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Harold Carabell. I am the president of the West Pine McQueen Neighborhood Association. Where tell the truth? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll take it for granted. Yes, we know each other from past controversies, so we always tell the truth. Right? Um, I'm the president of uh, the West Pine McQueen Neighborhood Association. It's a small neighborhood association. Uh, it extends from the center line uh, of Sarah to the center line of Newstead east to west, and from the center line of McLean to the center line of Forest Park. North, uh, north to south. And Lawrence Group approached us with his plan to rehab the uh, Obama's building uh, at the corner of Lindell and Sarah. We too were ecstatic. Uh, I'm also on the Brooks Committee, the Development Committee, and we have a development committee within our neighborhood association, of which Dan Helmut and I uh, are the two members. And of course, Dan was over the moon about this because it was an early HLK building uh, that could be finally saved. And uh, the Lawrence Group's reputation, of course, speaks for itself. We had just been through a, a very bruising battle. Some of you are intimately familiar with that, uh, dealing with the CVS. In fact, the Brooks Bad reporter who called me about this proposal and wrote a story on it called a very contentious neighborhood association. But really, not that. Uh, all of my neighbors, uh, almost all of my neighbors, lived in, lived in these stores late 19th century or early 20th 
century houses. Uh, we could be accused of being building hunters, probably, uh, with a passion for red brick and Victorian, and not too many mid-century modern aficionados in our group, but we do re recognize uh, the importance and the historicity uh, of the early old line building. So we're just thrilled to see it hopefully become uh, what Lawrence Group proposes, a mixed-use property. In the best of all worlds, uh, I like Steve. It was a favor, never favored the demolition of any structure in his own property. Uh, even though the aesthetics of this building are a fully one way of building no one in our neighborhood, uh, I call it an example of uh, sort of Americanized or domesticated international style, and no one is way to the building. But it's structurally sound, and again, in the best of all worlds, I might concur with, with Ms. Bradley's recommendation. Uh, we don't precisely live in the best of all worlds, economically speaking. And, and I take uh, Steve and Greg at their words, absolutely, when they say this project will not work without the demolition of 4108. Uh, more than any of the developers with whom we have ever dealt with us in our neighborhood association, Lawrence Group has gone out of our way to meet our reasonable objections, uh, which call for the elimination of the existing curb cut on Linda with 4108 and the construction of a well landscaped screen. I don't think the screen was especially well landscaped in the uh, schematics that we've seen so far, the elevation, but I'm sure Lawrence Group will be amenable to uh, well landscaping us. I would cite IKEA as, as sort of the archetype at the other end of the uh, spectrum. Uh, that is essentially a big box suburban store in the middle of the parking lot. And yet, we in the neighborhood uh, were willing to go along with that because IKEA is just too important uh, to say no to. And I think uh, the same thing is true for the former housing authority building that I think was built as, as the Remington Land uh, Corporation headquarters in St. Louis. Uh, so, because 4108 must go to make this project viable, to make it even work, uh, no one is wed to it. And, and I would encourage, in this case, the Preservation Board to overrule the findings of cultural resources. Uh, in the past, we had a very bruising battle in our association over the new construction that Ronald McDonald did years back before I became president of the association. That controversy nearly uh, destroyed our neighborhood association. We ended up, in some ways, with the worst of all worlds, with the loss even of one of the outstanding Romanist survived carriage houses in the entire city. Uh, and with compromise, it could have been avoided. I think this is a compromise solution. It's absolutely essential uh, for the neighborhood to get this built. In terms of zoning variances, I work closely with John Bull, the alderman, and with Book Six uh, predecessor, Dan Krasnoff, on formulating the form based code. And if everything that uh, Ms. Bradley says it is intended to do. In this case, however, uh, I and my neighbors in the association wholeheartedly would support the variance because we think it is so critical to get the old body building we have as a mixed use property. Questions? Alderman Smith. So, I mean, I'm struggling in the same way that you are. Can you point to one of the standards that were laid out to us in mm -hmm. terms of an exception for the standards on demolition review? Or point to some basis in the law that we can make our decision not sort of on when we keep the one building, but those standards in, in terms of a merit, structurally sound building, all of that. Is there anything that, that what I found so far as the redevelopment plan, which we don't have yet, but could be something we could hang our hand on? Uh, there's a provision, you know, in, in any code, there's a provision for variance. And we've actually done by us. Well, in the form based code, the form based code contains provisions for variance. We have to do a variance, for example. For, on, on the demolition. On the, on the demolition, it's never come up. It's never come up. I think you'd have to bring John Hole in here, probably, to explain the ins and outs of that. Ins and outs of that. But uh, the form based code was never intended. I think to preserve buildings to which no one is really led architecturally or historically and that would stand in the way of a project like this. That's certainly not the intent of the form based code. And I'm sure John and his assistant wrote into that provision that would take that into account. Thank you. And you mentioned the CBN proposal. Didn't that involve the demolition of not only these two buildings plus the colonial revival? Uh, it, it did with a three-part part, including that Georgian Revival building immediately to that, which, and behind which I lived personally, and I've lived for 30, nearly 30 years, by the way. Uh, it, it did, and we ended up, the, the neighborhood so wanted that corner to be developed, uh, the, uh, that there was a reason for development, that, and it was before the form based code, just before it was implemented, and, and finished and implemented. Uh, we apparently loaded up CBS with so many onerous 
positive. They didn't simply walk away. And then they walked down the street. And I think they ended up with a better solution in the neighborhood because of that. Even though I, I had some affection for that sort of international style repair shop in Bay that was demolished at the AAA. All right, any further questions? Thank you. Make one clarification. The four base mode is absolutely neutral on demolition sites. Not neutral in the facts, but it's neutral on demolition. All right, thank you. Uh, we have one more uh, speaker, Michael Allen. Good afternoon, I'm Michael Allen. I reside at 4176 Russell Boulevard. I swear to tell the truth. Um, as you can right now, I'm an architectural historian director of the Preservation Research Office, but I'm speaking right now as vice president of the board of directors of Modern FTL, St. Louis Mid Century Modern Preservation Organization. So, this is a statement from the board. Um, first off, before we get into the seriousness, I just want to say we are very excited that the prospect of renovating the Remington Rand building and the prospect of that being done by a developer with the capacity and vision of the Lawrence Group is on the table at all. So. Uh, we do we do like that. However, uh, Modern STL concurs with the Cultural Resources Office's recommendation of denial of preliminary demolition applications to the building at 4108 Wendell Boulevard and commend the authors for a strong and thorough recommendation. The building at 4108 Wendell Boulevard illustrates the importance of supporting buildings to create contexts that enhance the architectural power of more significant works like the Remington Rand building. In 2009, the Bel Air Motel at 4630 Linda Boulevard was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The nomination included a survey of modernist buildings on Lindell between Grand and Kings Highway that were built between 1939 and 1977. This survey inventoried 32 modernist buildings known or still standing, including 4108 Lindell. We now know there are several more that have already been demolished that were not found in that research. The strength of this concentration helped prove the architectural significance of the Bel Air Motel, which was then listed in the National Register and rehabilitated with historic tax credits. The erosion of the concentration of Lindell's modern buildings not only removes minor works of greatness, it could impede efforts to get the major works listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Planning on Lindell needs to turn down momentary expedience in favor of long-term retention of buildings that collectively define the significance of the street. The development of multiple property documentation form for Lindell Boulevard's modern architecture could allow for National Register designation of buildings like 4108 Lindell. While such a document does not yet ex exist, its development would allow historic tax credits to become available for lesser buildings like 4108. The developer has initiated a nomination to the National Register for the Remington Rand Building. Perhaps an expanded approach would be more beneficial. Certainly between the Bel Air nominations, the St. Louis Modern Survey, the Preservation Board examined last year, and other sources, the Lindell context could be drafted easily. The story is no longer obscure, and the facts are well documented. Certainly, the impact of demolition also contradicts the goals of the farm based zoning over Lane Wendell, as well as the momentum toward increasing density in the central corridor. News reports on new developments around the area have been frenetic, with one common denominator. Retail and residential projects here are adding to, not subtracting from, the central city's building stock and density. Demolition here makes no sense. Lindell already has lost a few works of modern architecture, including the Cinerama that fell to build the Walgreens and the Bel Air, or the uh, De Villa Motel for the parking lot of the cathedral. Two years ago, CVS may well have added to that count by wrecking W.A. Sarmiento's landmark, landmark AAA building had it not been for the wisdom of the Preservation Board in its unanimous denial. We knew then that there was, that would not be the last time a developer sought demolition of a modern gem on Lindell. We know that the current request won't be the last either. Hopefully the Preservation Board continues to protect Lindell's modern buildings and promote creative solutions to development goals. The successful outcome of CVS's quest to demolish the AAA building, the modern building's preservation alongside a new urban scale building, shows that the Preservation Board is on the right track for historic preservation and for urban design excellence. I'm going to ask for a motion and discussion. Yeah, this, this is for discussion. Um, and hopefully, I 
made it so complicated. Um, did the preservation board um, approve grant preliminary approval of the demolition of 4108 Lindell and indicate approval of the rehabilitation of 4100 Lindell with the following conditions? Um, that there must be approval of a redevelopment plan that calls for the, the demolition of 4108. Uh, that the building permit be uh, approved for 4100 Lindell. That the project be developed as proposed and that the design details will be reviewed and approved by the Cultural Resources Office. I'm not crazy about demolition of 4108. Um, um, I'm not sure that any one of the standards sort of give us any one particular thing to hang our hair on. I, I believe that there was um, testimony regarding the difficulty of redeveloping 4100, and it will be pretty much of a hardship if we are stuck in a position that we're left with those two buildings standing with no good use to them given the factors that are there. Um, I do believe that the, stand, the standards do provide for us to look at a redevelopment plan that calls specifically for demolition of 4108 as long as there's also the rehabilitation of 4100. Um, and I think we still have the ability to look at this with good landscaping and the screening of the parking if the Cultural Resources Office has an opportunity to look at this. And we also hope that we have a building permit as well before we allow the demolition. So it's not sort of on a get come basis for the demolition of this. Any discussion on the table? Mayor. Anybody well left? Ellie? I, mean, I, think, well, I think you've uh, addressed all of my concerns in your conditions. I think we are a little out of order in that uh, we just talked at our last meeting that the, the zoning should come first. And you've conditioned upon that they actually have a building permit in hand. We put demolish 4108. And so obviously, if they have a building permit in hand, they've addressed the, the zoning uh, aspects of the project. Um, I think also. Just as a preliminary review, I think it makes sense the way you, you did your motion that if we do have a redevelopment plan that's approved by the Board of Alderman that authorized 4108, our standards are such that there are weighted criteria and that would be to have the most weight. So I think then um, it would make sense and demolition would be appropriate um, considering everything else. And then adding the conditions for the landscape and the other details, I think that addresses it as well. So since it is a preliminary review, I think your motion makes sense rather than making them come back. It's like, hey, you have our preliminary, uh, you have our, uh, preliminary, our approval as long as you go through the other process that would, would uh, justify the demolition. So I'm going to do a roll call vote on this one. If you're good. Okay, uh, Commissioner Batten? Uh. Commissioner Robinson? Commissioner no. Clean? No. Commissioner Aye. Commissioner Visitator? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Wright? Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Uh, we have five ayes and two no's. The ayes have it.
All right, I think we're back, uh, ready to get back in session here. I'd like to call item D, 2016 North Newstead Avenue. Hey, my name is Jan Cameron of the Cultural Resources Office, and I come to tell the truth. I would like to enter into the record ordinance 64689, our labeling ordinance, and ordinance 60236, the bill starts with so my, I'm sorry to interrupt, but my right is this 
until we moved out in 1991. Since then, we've been a property owner. We've been leasing it, using it as a rental property, finding tenants and occupancy. Uh, a couple corrections. She had mentioned that it's going to be a mini mart. It's actually a full grocery store, uh, not just a mini mart. Number two, as far as some of these um, window enclosures that are in question, um, I also want to apologize. I just got the this, uh, this proposal, the email on Friday from Mrs. So I'm not as pres uh, properly ready to present. I do have a couple of photos to for you guys to submit as um, exhibits. Give you a little bit more history. This, this is a photo that was on a development, or I'm sorry, on a on the property. The St. Louis Development Organization actually had a proposal in to purchase this property from us in 2008. That is a copy of it that has a picture of the block windows that were done. Um, I also have, um, and this is where I came unprepared. This is an actual old negative of my family since the 70s, and I could not get it into actual photo form, but if you guys would like to look at it, it shows that those windows have been locked in since the 70s. I would like these back. That is my only copy. So to say that this is in question is that all these windows were not in its existing form. These windows have been blocked in since I was a young boy. I'll also tell that the first two windows that are on each side, the first window on St. Ferdinand and the first window on Newstead was not. They were existing aluminum windows with plexiglass, but it also had chain link as that added security on the front of those windows. As a choice to redevelop this property, the New developer, the, the, the new grocer that is here present today, as well as myself, thought it would be in the best interest of the property to make and conform them with the other five windows that had been blocked in and painted, as you see in here, and uh, to conform with what the existing the existing structure had looked like. I was not aware that this did not meet their the um, um, the board or the um, uh, the bills redevelopment district or area, we were not told that it would not conform with it. As she mentioned, it was approved. Number two, the work stop order actually showed up with the contractor on Monday. The work had been completed on Friday. It was only two windows. It took them about four hours to complete it. So as they stated that the work order did arrive, but the job and the work had already been completed before the work stop order had arrived. Um, in addition, the chain link fence gave it added security. Our thought, our um, uh, the Ville, as a neighborhood, has been struggling to redevelop since we moved out in 1991 and closed our cleaning operation. Um, this, since we've been the owner occupant, or since we were the owner occupant, now that we are the we are the landlord, we see tenant. This is the first large commercial development in this neighborhood. The, my tenant has substantially put money invested in this, putting the kitchen in, upgrading the electric. He is here committed to the neighborhood, trying to do the right thing, making the neighborhood some type of redevelopment. Every block around us has since been demolished. When I was uh, when we left in '91, all four corners of that prop up on that street had buildings on them. We are the only building on the corner that's left. Everything else has been demolished and is now a vacant lot. Um, the uh, sorry, I'm getting a little off track. Um, going to the, the necessary steps, um, the the owner or, or sorry, the tenant would agree with removing those two front block windows to return it to its condition that it was when he took and signed the lease agreement, which was less than 30 days ago. We would like you to consider that the block was in an existing five windows prior to the construction. It is providing him security for the property and that is in a more set 
manner than the chain link fencing that was there previously, providing the security. Um, I think that's completing my notes. I, I appreciate you. I'm sorry I'm not as well spoken as the last group that was up here. Welcome to answering questions that you have. Well, I'll start it off. So, are you saying your um, is your testimony that? On the, the new system side that, um, that we're looking at right there, the north elevation, that uh, it was only the window closest, the opening closest to the 24. Correct. Or the window just to the left, and then the small window just to the right. And that's the window that we had left open. And all other bays have been. Bricked up. up young, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes. Bricked up since. They have been bricked up since I was a young boy. Jan, did you look at. What My understanding was that there were, I'm sorry, that there were say, four windows that had been previously fucked up, not five. Sorry. It's been five. It's been. Uh, That's not what it shows on Google. Well, and looking at here. On your on your uh, slide here, it, it looks. It looks like all the ones in the north elevation were blocked up. I believe that's just signage. The one that's closest to it might have just been some signage, like that that was taken before I was alive. So, but unfortunately, I was not prepared enough to find any other family photos of the property. I could take them up and submit them at some other time. Um, but my testimony is that since I've been alive, those five out of seven have been in its consistent form. The only thing that they did was freshly paint the five so that they all match. Well, we're looking at Google Earth. Let's take a. We might call you back up. Can we take our next speaker, uh, Marco Felix? My name is Marco Felix, uh, 7361 Naples Drive, and I swear to tell the truth. And I'm the contractor for this building, and when I started the job, I had the building permit approved and he was called for blocking and breaking in, closing off the windows for security and he was approved but when I started, uh, when I finished my work, um, uh, I was told that not to do anything on Friday uh, but I didn't see the inspector, I just was told over the phone. I don't know who called but I didn't take that seriously until I see the inspector and the stop work order in my hand. So I kept going and I closed up the windows that were remaining. And I, finally the inspector showed up on Monday, but the work was already done. So I didn't take the phone call seriously because I didn't know who, who came from. I think it was the other man, which by the way it was a tenant on that building before us, before we started the work. So uh, when they came and told me to stop, I finally stopped and I went in and got a new building permit again to keep on going. That's why I didn't stop because I kept going inside and nothing on the on the outside because everything was on outside. So I, I did everything by that was required and I did everything that I got approved of, which was closing up the windows. I got the build, original building permit here, which was approved. And then I got canceled. Could you give that? Yes. And so does that how does that show how many windows were going to be locked up? Yes. And how many does it show? All of them. Well, how many? In the back, in the back of the building, there's some several windows. As you can see in the picture, that's an abandoned building. They can build a, a burned up building next to it. And we allowed the criminals to go on that property, so we we had to close that. So well, they were. I, I think sorry to interrupt. But I think we're concerned about the north side, north elevation, and the west side. So how many windows did your permit show to block up on the north elevation? Four. Uh, only on the inside, but we found out it, it was not possible on the inside. There was metal. Uh, really, uh, protection on the inside that could not be breaked out. Okay. So a different way to ask this question. So on Friday when you were doing the work, what windows did you break out? The back ones. 
So when did you brick up the windows on the north elevation? Well, it was at the beginning of the week. And on that north elevation there, which shows three bricked up bays, how many did you do the work on? This is the one, this is the one little one on the, right before the gate. That's the one I was working on. It was just, it was already bricked up. I just closed it all the way. Okay, but what about the one, the bay closest to the front door, 2416, that, that, that bay? Did you bring up this bay? That, that one, yes. But this one was already bricked up? Yes. This was already bricked yes. up? Yes. You did? That's just this bay. That's what I was doing. Okay, and then... You, when, when, when I got the phone call, excuse me, I, that's the one I was working on. Okay. That little one. Can you flip to the, do we have the west elevation line? Okay, so let's do the same thing on. Did you do this one? Yes, that was already done. This one was already done? No, no. That, I did that one. It was already there. Already there. I did that. You did this one? Yeah. Okay, so you did three complete bays and then that partial one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you think Jan that's consistent with Google Earth? Google Maps? Um
and then the window on the far left. And then I think you have a slide that's the one oh, on the far right as well, which is consistent with what you said on Google Maps. So, and I thought I heard the owner say that they were uh, agreeable or understood that they would undo the two pluses to the front door. But we're really talking about that. Is that a door? Is that what that is on the far left? Yeah, it's some kind of a large door. So was there a transom or something? Um, it, it's hard to tell because it's been altered. So it was either a window similar to the others where it um, actually had a transom. Yeah. But it was boarded up at the time on the Google. So what would you recommend that he do there? Uh, one of the problems is the white paint makes it extraordinarily unattractive. Um, and I think it would be good if we assume that they could leave that particular opening, which is fairly obscured by security gate and the door, painted the existing closures a color similar to the brick and then opened the two on either side of the main entry. That would, I think, be a reasonable compromise given the history of this project, which has not been clear. Any further questions for Jan? Jan, I'm curious how did this happen? Was this just an oversight by permitting? Of your instruction? I believe the oversight happened at the plan exam section. And um, the architect did. Approved plans and notice or realize the fact that there was a zero point on it. Did this come across your desk at all? No. No, okay, so you brought your attention after the Correct. So, do you have a question for Jane? So, what color are these bricks? They're variegated, greenish reddish. I call it. Greenish, right? Yeah, it's a little green. Closure? No, it's a brick. It's called variegated, and it's very, very common in uh, craftsman style properties. Not a bakery brick, it's very. No, it's dark in color, and the reason it looks so different is a lot of it has been cut pointed in white, and that has really made it. But the actual color of the building is what you see above the window. Which has the original dark board. And then the, the window has a little decorative hood of terracotta. Terracotta runs along the terracotta. Anything further for Jean? Just want to tell you something else you want to add. I wanted to add that uh, there's been a dispute between the alderman and this particular process. That was probably not shared with me in my original conversation. And one of the reasons why this has got a complaint is this approval of their occupancy and going through the steps of getting an approval. So there's been some. The, the alderman has been, in, has, been uh, has not approved of his particular sense, despite the city's, the rest of the city's approval, so. So, um, this is not this process, but normally there's a process for either a convenience store or a grocery store, and they have to get, uh, uh, go through a um, commission of use process normally. And that, that all in the city. When, when did that happen? October 15th. There's your, it was at Main City Hall. They, they met and we and they had a, an appeal and all those approvals were met and the, the alderman at that meeting disapproved and got up and spoke. Despite his disapproval, the city approved his particular occupancy and his particular uh, business license and occupancy work permit and it proceeded correctly since then. Discussion on this one. So um, I would move that we 
approve the uh, or uphold the uh, director's denial with regard to the enclosure on the north side immediately to the left of the doorway as you're looking at it in the photo and on the west side immediately to the right of the doorway as well as the um, on the west side window that was also put in on the very far right side of the west elevation that goes with the that brick in area, actually blocked in area, would be removed and the windows restored. Obviously, not with the pencil. Um, and painting the brick like color over the far left area over the doorway in the north elevation. Is there a second to that for discussion? Far west, on the west side of the far bay, 
than that partial bay above that door on the corner of the side.
again, uh, if you're placed and for materials want to match the appearance, that builds into kind of statement effects on the property itself as well as the street space. Um, the owner uh, lives and has buildings in their house and he doesn't own other houses and shops on that space. I think he understands this work rule. And beyond that, uh, staff recommends that the board uphold the denial application to the court removal as it is not in compliance with the shelly storage standards. Bob, uh, did you did I did you hear did I hear you introduce the ordinance or I did. The question is for Bob. Thank you. Oh, Bob, uh, I do have one quick question, Bob. Oh. Is there any hardship information? Uh, not provided. It's going to be um, do so time with nothing. Jim, yeah. Good evening, my name is Jim Yam. I live at 4410 Campbell. I am the owner and occupant of uh, the pictured building there. Um, a couple of clarifying points, and thank you, Bob, for such a great detail. Uh, one of the things that Bob said was for pavement soft brick. That was apparently some very substandard brick that was put in originally when the corners were there. I have just sourced the matching brick to the front of that building. So what we're talking about is if you look at kind of that ugly yellow brick, there's about five rows of bricks where the corners work. Kind of hit that facade. Below that is a little bit of decorative trim. So what I'm proposing is pulling off that decorative trim, which is, as Bob said, quite frankly, expensive. In tin, even in a composite material, is still very expensive. So it's basically taking with that one decorative row of brick is, matching all the way up to the terracotta, and replacing it as is. So it's removing those four feet, retucking it with matching brick to match the rest of the existing structure of the building, and then to be able to tuck that all the way up to the terracotta and replace it. That's what the proposal is in terms of what I'm requesting to do, as opposed to putting up the facade. Questions, comments, concerns. I did find that I did source matching bricks, so it's not just a tough point activity. Uh, I did find the matching source bricks uh, and these are available. Questions for Mr. Yam? So, uh, the staff would like you to put this cornice back up. Is that something that you priced that to? Yeah, I did. Uh, just, just so you guys, I started to all the detail. Uh, cornice work, uh, either tin and or composites, roughly 3600 bucks. And the tough point is roughly 3600 bucks. So we're talking about a $7,000 activity versus a $3,500 activity. So, again, uh, historical, long time, lifelong resident of Shaw, fully understand historical code. I believe this is a reasonable accommodation. It's going to be good to the effort that, in terms of sourcing the bricks, finding the materials, and to be able to make sure that it keeps complete with the structural integrity of the building. Thank you. Do you have questions? I think I understood what you said. Sure. So it looks like there's about five rows of soft brick that are behind the corners. And what you're proposing is your removal of the soft brick? It, it's it's, it's actually, I, I'll be happy to clarify, right? So every, the five rows of soft brick are the things that are directly behind where that soffit currently is and where it's finally decayed after the 100 years. So it's really taking those five rows of soft bricks out and matching it with the kind of brown, sandy bricks that are in the front of the rest of the building to match everything all the way to the terracotta line. So that's really what it is. It's tucking everything above that soft brick, taking out the five rows of soft bricks where they're decayed, retuck pointing those with matching bricks to accommodate the facade, and to tuck point, remove all the bricks and retuck point all the way up to the top of the terracotta as it's currently, as the building currently stands. So you get the Purchasing bricks, right? Or I've, got, I've got them under commitment, right, from a local brick specialty historic supplier. Right, so I've got it. So it's well, how much are the bricks? Bricks are roughly uh, what, what the contract calls for is roughly $1,000 bricks. And it's going to cost 3600 at some point? Yes. Again, building scaffolding is really what the expense is, right? And so I, I source all that. And to put the cornice. $3,600 to build the corners and install it there. I would not have to put the historical quality brick behind it, right? Because apparently you can put up soft brick right behind it and stick the corners on top and call it a day. So I view this as an improvement to the facade of the building as opposed to having those soft bricks that are behind there. Well, it, and probably the commissioners have gotten sick of me saying this sort of stuff, but this is one of the reasons why I don't have a local district. 
that ordinance 59400, according to what was presented uh, to us, says on details, architectural details of existing structures such as cones, dormers, porches, and bay windows should be maintained in their original form, if at all possible. Why is it not possible, given the fact that replacing it with brick would cost $4,600? Why is it not possible just to put in what already existed for thirty six hundred dollars? In terms of just putting the again, if I put the facade in, it's the facade and the brick, right? Every stuff point everything up to the terracotta. So the total project is not one or the other. And I'm sorry if that was not clear in the way that I stated that. Right? So to rebrick it, to purchase the brick and touch point, purchase the brick roughly a thousand dollars. Their cut point up to the terracotta line is $3,600. What we're talking about is the difference between the $1,000 in the bricks and the $3,600, which is the exact cost for the, to replace a piece of tin or the decorative item plus the cut pointing expense. All right, so it's not one or the other. I'm sorry for the clarification. That wasn't stated very clearly. So you're, you're planning on cut pointing the whole thing? Oh, absolutely. From, from, where? from, from basically, if you see where the, there's a, see what those squares, little fancy bricks are, then there's a little ledge there. If everything from that ledge all the way to the terracotta line will be re tuck pointed with matching bricks. So here, my math all oh, right, we're really just talking about a difference of $2,500. Yes, it's my $2,500, that's correct. But that, that's the reasonable request because I believe it's, a, it's an improvement to the facade whether it's the uh, structural little decorative piece that's finally brought out. But I think it's going to make it look match much, it'll match much more to the building to the east, which do not have that decorative facade. Well, I don't need to want to minimize the 2500 bucks. Sure. I want to spend 2500 bucks either. But it's like we don't have a reasonable standard. We have a, you're asking basically for a variance and we need a hardship. And so why can't you afford 7200 you know, We're getting, uh, my math was 72 versus 46. Sure. So, you don't have the resources for the additional twenty five hundred dollars. I did not. I, I did not submit a full set of financial statements, and I did not realize the level of detail we were going to get into with respect to that. So it is. I believe that, just, that putting higher quality brick and putting an impressive the facade is a much better solution than putting up it to be not even the historical pin, but some sort of composite material on top of that. So sure. the, the the brick. The sort of yellow brick that would be replaced as well. No, absolutely. It's going back. It's going back as is. I'm sorry. It's going back as is unless you guys like the match. Have me match the rest of the bricks. But the yellow bricks, they were there when I bought the building 24 so, years ago. So, with the the solution that you're proposing, is part of that solution to take out the yellow bricks? I was just trying to put the yellow bricks back in because I believe that's how the building should look or has looked. I can, I can replace the yellow bricks with the existing sandstone bricks because they he has enough of those bricks to do. So those, I'm, I, I, maybe I'm having a tough, tough time seeing them. Sure. So those yellow bricks, were those original bricks? Yeah, or yeah they were there. Okay, I can't see it. Oh, yeah, I'm having a tough Yeah. But what about the kids? Sure, no, absolutely. So, yeah. But further questions of the applicant? Sure. Yes. Um, Okay. Are you tough pointing or are you are you so you're using the term tough pointing? I'm trying to determine if you were tough pointing or if you were in fact relaying all of the sure, We are we are pulling the brick down to the decorative row and relaying all the bricks from that piece all the way to the terracotta and re-putting the terracotta in as it currently stands. So it's a complete tear down. We're going to mortar it, tear it down, and put it back up as a proposal. So you're, you're talking about the terracotta coping. Yeah, coping. So I'm sorry. Terracotta coping. Yeah. Then, there's, there's roughly 12 rows of brick down to that decorative spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can, can you hit that one little ledge there? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we can do that. Right. He, right. This is, again, I was confused too. He's proposing to move the corner, rebuild everything from there on the line all the way up the top with new brick to match the brick below. That's basically what Yeah, thank you. They're much better than I did. So Bob, since you're up there, the, yep. the blonder brick, would that have been original? I, I think it's been rebuilt, obviously. At some point in time, the corners itself 
just paraffin has, has been refilled. I didn't look at which I'll give you some back after the cleaning. The paraffin has been refilled. Yeah, it's been all the time. The corn, however, right. has not. The metal corn is a still feature and, and just that that was refilled. At some point from this point up, maybe a little higher up here, that was rebuilt. But the corn is what, you, what you're looking at is years of burdening. This is what happens when you do not repoint your building. Things like this happen. So the only new brick would be going behind where the corner is now. From what I gather, yeah, he's going to install new brick where the soft brick was and then relay, reuse, I would assume, relay the brick consisting above it. Okay, so this is the floor now. So the so the blonde brick, you're, you're saying that that's a, that was original? No, we're saying we believe that the Okay, so my point Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry about doing it. That was my question. Were you was your intention to replace the blonde brick with the matching brown brick in the with your solution? Or were you intending on I, I was placing the blonde, the blonde brick because that's how the building looks. I would be happy to replace it with everything from that one decorative line all the way up to the little stone so it matches. I'm fine with a quality solution. I'm just supposed to having to put that out of decorative trim piece in some sort of uh, material that's probably not historically accurate. So, and I do take exception with the one that's far deferred maintenance. Uh, I don't think there's been any deferred maintenance to that building or any other buildings in the I'm building. Sorry, sir. Unless you had a storm that suddenly took that down, that's deferred maintenance. And, so, and it, it's rusted out and it, it, it's left for that for a long time. Thank you, thank you for that. And isn't it just family? Do you have rental property also? Uh, yes, I do. But you have an income on this addition to your own revenue. Yes, I do. Thank you. But I do not believe that replacing that as it stands without considering the approval and the appearance of the historical building with higher quality brick all the way top is something we should move forward without considering. Thank you. Sorry, so did you uh, meet with the neighborhood association? Uh, I did not formally request the neighborhood association support, nor from the alderman. An informal discussion, which is if I need your help, can I bring information forward to you guys? And they said yes. So it wasn't a formal request under any circumstance, either to the alderman or to the neighborhood association. Any further questions of the applicant? Thank you. Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Rathen? 
up, we have four special agenda items which are nominations to the National Register. Um, we are, we do have, uh, I think we still have the preparers of all four of these here, correct? So uh, we're going to have a presentation by Beth, are you present a little bit or just have them present? Um, no, okay. well. Why don't we just go to the preparer and then the staff members who handle this will remind everybody of what we're going
as a nationally important property, and then it will go to D.C., and at that point, we hope it will be forwarded to the NHL reviewer and Omaha Park Service. So this is the first step towards that. In fact, it was written, uh, we coordinated with the people in Omaha to see how we need to do this, so it's set up to go in that direction. Other questions? I have a question. I mean, is this a, is this grant that this is status? Will it affect um, uh, new construction? Like the no, no, the cemetery, and that's why it looks great today because they have worked very hard to keep the character of the cemetery. In fact, there's a new columbarium that's there now, and the SHPO is aware of it, has reviewed it. It's done uh, with the landscape, the historic landscape in mind, and so everything is reviewed. They can continue to do their projects. Do you think it does? I mean, to me, it's so modern. I, I it's very modern, but it's also very low to the ground, and it's very empathetic with the surroundings. That part of the cemetery was never built up with a lot of mausoleums and tombs, and it's in an area by the lakes there, and it's very well done. Very compatible. Okay, do you have a motion on this one? Oh. Well, I had a question, or it's not it's indirectly related to this insofar as we, at least I struggled with this when we were talking about the um, plus. Okay, so we talked about something that seems to be similar in my mind. It sort of was the significance of the plus. And then there weren't any standards. I felt like we were just sort of set out there. So what are the standards here? Well, this is not being designated as a city landmark. Right. It's being designated to the National Register and after that to a higher classification, which is called a National Historic Landmark. Right. And so... Like the old courthouse. And right. The cathedral so there. when it's a national landmark, and they come in and you review it, you're not going to review it at all? We would not review it. So this is just a designation, honorarily, for them to get uh, get the recognition. Right. It's generally an honorary designation. Now it has some ramifications of federal money and things like that, but it is not the designated the standards that they have to adhere to. And I think really the only thing that could happen if they didn't do the right thing would be that its designation would be removed. But if we put it on the register, then if they did want to demolish that modeling, and we would review that. We would review it under the preservation review ordinance, yes. So the staff supports it in its long Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay, okay. <clears throat> I would like to move that the preservation uh, direct the staff to prepare before the ship of that the property meets the requirements for fire training and keep the land in the last Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay, uh, Lindsay, do you want to take us through 1517 Carver Avenue? Good evening. Lindsay Derry from the Preservation Research Office. Um, this is the Woodward Chairman Company Building, completed in 1925. It's out at 1519 Tower Grove Avenue. Um, the building is being nominated under, um, being nominated for local significance under Criterion C. Architecture is an excellent example of Bayless Factory design in St. Louis, and then also is an excellent example of Cliff um, and Rapid Industrial Work. So this is the building's main facade um, facing east of Wilson Tower Grove Avenue. Um, the building is actually three stories tall, just with the rise of Tower Grove and the way of the site slopes. You can only see a full three stories on this south side. Um, this curves along the Missouri Pacific Railroad track. Um, and it's a good example of how um, probably a good 85% of this factory's um, original industrial steel sash windows are intact, which for the building of its age and the fact that it's been in continuous use since it was completed in 1925 is really remarkable. Um, so going into the building, um, this is the main entrance vestibule off of Tower of Avenue. You can see it's not in use currently, but you go in um, on actually second story because the rise of the street up this grand staircase and into this um, main sort of 
office entry area that actually extends across the entire building. Um, this area has a lot of its original wood details, such as the doors, workgrounds, wainscoting, and then these um, oak um, office partitions that go throughout this area. You can see more of this over here. Um, you can also see this entire area has a drop ceiling, and once that is removed, um, there are actually light monitors that stretch across the whole part of the building, which have very significant, um, very significant um, highlights that would allow a lot of natural light to come in and really open this space up as it was originally designed. Um, so then we'll just go through the other um, more industrial warehouse space in the building because they really take up most of its interior. So this is on the third floor. Um, you can see these really large windows. Um, these are just some uh, original steel thatch, steel thatch partitions that remain. This is the second story. You can see these really, again, large um, daylight factory windows and the light monitors that um, also retain the original steel thatches. So they're sort of covered at the moment. Um, Another shot of the second story with the both steel trusses. And then this is the first story. Um, and you can see the uh, mushroom capital system is another hallmark of the daylight factory. Um, while Woodward and Tiernan was one of the biggest commercial printers in St. Louis during the latter part of the 19th century and through the middle 20th century, there's not a lot of information about this firm um, after this building was constructed. Most of that information is from before 1925 which is why we're pursuing um, our sexual significance, but it's high degree of integrity. Um, and again, it's a good example of the kind of rapid in industrial work um, make it look like significant. So um, that's about it. Do you guys have any questions? What can I ask you? Why have you dominated? Our client is the St. Louis, uh, the Immersion School. St. Louis Immersion School. They have long-term plans for building. Um, currently, the suburban industrial packaging is still occupying the building, so it's still in use right now. Questions? Yeah. Jack and Curtis of the Building and Health Bowl and Country Institute. Do I have a motion? Someone second? Second. All right. All right. All in favor? All right. All right. All right. All right. Later career, a lot of Bradshaw's buildings have 
been listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Almost every work in St. Louis is still standing in uh, the early part of its career. Uh, it's either listed as an individual building or in a historic district. Um, but as later buildings maybe uh, aren't as familiar or well understood by architectural historians, here's a photograph of Mr. French. I almost included an obituary photograph, but the uh, obituary that a uh, well, Democrat ran was rather uh, garish. It said, um, Noted architect dies and a photograph of Bradshaw with his eyes closed. Oh, I'm not scary here today. Um, just to put this a little bit in context, um, a very similar early work of his the Weber Implement Company building. I'm sure many of you drive by this building, walk by, bike by. It. Uh, this building is basically essentially a three story uh, bearing on the warehouse form, reinforced concrete warehouse with uh, window bays, uh, sort of very gridded appearance, dressed in brick. Uh, here at Limestone Terracotta. Uh, his more familiar major works uh, than the Paul Brown Building of 1926, listed in the National Register of Historic Places, the Coronado Hotel, contributing to the Midtown Historic District from 1925 and 1929, building two phases. Um, and then the later part of his career, the, of course, the Depression uh, slowed his practice, as it did for most major designers in St. Louis. Uh, one of his notable uh, later works during the Depression is St. Louis and Area Roman Catholic Church in the Walnut Park neighborhood. Uh, beautiful work um, in this sort of um, uh, Renaissance revival styling. Um, wonderful building that is not listed in the National Register, does not have to be landmarked yet. It's probably eligible for both. Of course, the Mark Building, major uh, restoration recently done by the General Services Administration on Bradshaw's 1931. Uh, Art Deco Gem has developed the Terminal Railroad Association. Uh, a very major building compared to our rather modest scale General Electric Supply Corporation building, but it shows this transition between uh, the revival style of uh, phase of career uh, and this very much uh, modern era of uh, clients and, and his own understanding of the aesthetics and evolving aesthetics of the period sort of informing the work. Um, our building, in some ways, formally compared to the, the layout uh, and, and sort of carapace shape of the Maryland Plaza building, I'm sure you're familiar with those, uh, just a uh, piece of the Park Plaza Hotel, built in 1935 and 1939. There are uh, piers to our building, um, much more stylistically pronounced, of course, because they're commercial buildings on a very uh, uh, prominent uh, and affluent uh, residential street. Uh, another work of his that's contributing to the Central West End Historic District uh, is the Kirkwood Insurance Company building in 1936. Three-story building, again, uh, has Art Deco characteristics uh, in the stone uh, work at the top of the building at the entrances. Uh, but essentially, again, it is a, um, a rather a simple uh, gridded building with very pronounced uh, window bay division, much like ours. Ours. Uh, now, after our building was built in 1939, um, Bradshaw in 1940 uh, moved from the city of St. Louis to a chicken farm in Great Summit that he ran with his wife. Uh, he maintained an apartment at the Coronado Hotel, which he owned as an investment property. Uh, but he seems to have receded from, from active practice and produced only a few uh, additional major works. Um, one of those that is listed in the National Register is the Robert Shepard label on Tel Mar Boulevard, very plain modern box. Um, breaking even uh, more severely the tenets of the international style. This is listed for automobile uh, related significant conference architecture. Um, it's building on uh, Forest Park Avenue, I'm sure it's familiar uh, as the uh, Salvation Army Thrift Store, um, a streamlined modern building, making uh, plain use of black, uh, contrasting buff brick, very geometric, very nice building from 1946. Uh, sorry for the support photograph. And of course, the four departments at 1948, uh, 1950, right around the corner here, listed in the National Register of Historic Places for social significance. But again, showing this evolving uh, engagement with modernism at the end of the career of someone who's uh, very, very uh, well versed in, in both arts and, and revival style work. Uh, so, not an insignificant later body of work, and some of these later buildings do have National Register status. Um, Bradshaw passed away in 1953. Uh, his career um, became uh, very quickly sort of known uh, for National Register nominations going back to the 1970s. Uh, his reputation was so strong that when his uh, second wife Hilda died in 1983, fully two thirds of her obituary in the Samuel Post Dispatch uh, were devoted to a recapitulation of her late husband's architectural career. Uh, <laughs> not great. But um, the um, in, in conclusion, we um, 
urge the Preservation Board to uh, go against the Cultural Resources staff recommendation. We understand uh, the ambiguity around uh, the draft of the nomination. We uh, are rewriting the nomination uh, based on Bradshaw's career, including filling in a very clear context, taking out extraneous material on warehousing and other aspects. Um, however, the SHPO will not uh, allow another draft to be considered before the May 9th meeting of the Missouri Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Uh, we'd like to present our arguments to the council, uh, hopefully get council approval, and then submit a revised and very clarified and simplified draft to focus just on the aspect of Bradshaw's career there. Um, so we'd like to have the preservation board to support the zoning delegation. And uh, the owner is present. Uh, I would also like to speak to the station for or do you want to go on? Would you like to speak? Thank you. I'm Chip Reese, and I was getting late. Do um, you want to get somewhere? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here, I thought I was getting my anything. Um, so, my name is Audrey Kinsler. As Michael said, I'm one of the building owners. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the area where the building is located and our development plan for the building. The building is located in Midtown. It is approximately at the intersection of uh, Locust and Jefferson, and we're on the west end of the block. And just to paint the picture a little bit, this uh, block on Jefferson only has four buildings. Um, one is a very small story, and then there's three large buildings, which includes ours. Um, when we purchased our building about a year ago, all the big, all the big buildings were vacant. Um, so our building was foreclosed on, and uh, vacant for two years, the one across the street has been vacant for 25. <laughs> and then the other one is owned by an individual, but also vacant. So it's an area that really needs some investment. Um, and we would like to do that, which brings me to our development plan. So what we plan to do with building is um, build offices into it. We're going to use a quarter of the building space for our own businesses. And then we actually have some tenants lined up, um, some business acquaintances to fill the other space. Um, and I want to point out something else that I thought was kind of cool. Um, these acquaintances are located in Asia, and so we'll actually be bringing new, like, new business to St. Louis, like actual new businesses to St. Louis. So um, just to give you a little flavor, one of the businesses makes, um, like it's, it's a children's brand, so they make like little backpacks and things like that with like, you know, 3D teddy bear face on and stuff like that. But anyway, cool stuff. Um, so, in order to attract tenants like this, uh, we feel that we need to make the building fairly nice, for this example. Um, and in order to do that, we expect this uh, development to take about $2 million. Um, in order to justify that expense, we feel strongly that we need to be able to take advantage of the historic tax credit program. And that's why this nomination is so extremely important to us. Um, I should mention we do have the uh, alderman support on um, both the uh, development that we plan to do there and she also supports um, the building being listed. Um, so to summarize, we're in a location that really needs some development. We'd really like to do, this, to do the development here. Um, but in order to make this happen, we need support on the uh, nomination to the historic register. Are your businesses in the city already? called EFSA, and we make camera packs for adventure photographers. So those would be some of the guys that are shooting the Olympics or like the Red Bull athletes. Those are our customers. Um, and another one is called Vizier, and they do uh, work with CPT5. Thank you. Okay, we Yes, yes, we're in the big board.
understanding are those sort of the ones that they're designed that it can use in that. Or that there was an engineering aspect that um, valued form and function over collaboration with um, terracotta and such. You can tell if an industrial building was designed by an engineer or an architect trying to create uh, separation. And the engineers went for the street line list that architect Bradshaw adopted. So I feel he was looking at the engineering aspect. And his other buildings that we've seen, and then thank you, Michael, for a review of his career. I didn't know um, all his buildings. And he um, has flexibility. Each building seems to suit his purpose and look like it should be. However, I have to disagree with Michael's argument. I don't find it exceptionally significant um, with the warehouse building or in the number of Bradshaw's work. I think in this case, it might be best to either abstain or adopt my recommendation that might be advised to the council and the theory um, make the final decision at the meeting in the um, I again admire all the research that has, all the, I've learned about this company and this building from the nominations, but I just feel that it's so I've talked about creation with Christ to her and um, I feel that there are standards to be met. We have many wonderful buildings. We have so many historic buildings. Which ones are for companies that are um, designed to serve as perfect, but the fact of the matter is, by definition, they cannot call that historic for our country. No, we are at the top of the stage here on 41. We have a duty as a certified local government to consider these nominations and prepare reports. And we routinely do that in the you know, time to get favorable reports. So um, if there uh, one other property, I recommend we not make that a recommendation so the board site is otherwise. There is always the opportunity to use the fact that the state was unrecommended. Um, but the advisory council in Missouri, they uh, hear the comments from the staff, Michael will present to them, and then they make the final determination of whether And when I spoke in the ship with staff, they see why I to use their local knowledge and make well, that was the, the one issue I had. I mean, I, I think we need to, need to either set a yay or nay on it rather than abstain because we're charged with, you know, making, giving an opinion as to whether we think it's helpful or not, and your opinion is right. not. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. So if they were part of a uh, historic district, they'd probably be contributing to a problem, right? But again, the other point I can make, as I said about the, the other building on Lindsay, you don't have to have a credit project. You have an opportunity to make more interior changes, more partition space, however you wish. You don't need to maintain the wide open warehouse space. You know, there are requirements to be met for tax credit projects. There might be an opportunity for something interesting out of the exterior with the eye catching, interesting corners or entrance canopy or whatever, you know, that wouldn't be allowed under tax credit. So I feel that. Some of these buildings can be without relying on you as important as I understand the other questions? So, if we vote to override your recommendation, what does that mean for your report? You still write the same report and say the preservation board has to override this? All right, we, we report your decision. And um, that's the here these reports for the mayor to spend. We report the decision. We don't report all the work behind the building. That would just be our would it just be our decision, or would it also be the opinion you just stated? No, I mean there's an opportunity to set two opinions to the advisor council. One from the preservation board and one from the mayor. We tend to send the preservation board's decision through the mayor. 
So he can adopt the recommendations as his official body has to do this work. And I don't know of any situation where it's going to take the same with the mayors and the board. And, and if we were to uh, go down over at your, your suggestion, do you see that we're, that we're watering down this, this process for approving too many buildings? Or? Well, I, that's the fear I have. Of course, we've had wonderful experiences with um, National Register properties in our state with several tax credits and seeing these projects done. But the concept of the National Register and its fund buildings is right above the press and how true to take it. And those are the ones that we subsidize with tax credits. It resonates with me personally. And I've always worked with the standards of the National Register in that manner. UCS is here for tax credit projects and things that need to be reconciled with the understanding that not every bill is available. We don't wish to be out and be invested in the So that's the good so we're saying it doesn't be criterion A for architectural. Well, that, that's been considered and it's off the table, but I did wanted to point out that's been considered. Okay. And then what Mr. Allen just presented to us was criterion C in terms of the example for its use in the architect. But now I'm understanding that perhaps that's been abandoned and needs just well, there's several ways to approach architectural significance, and one is uh, an excellent example of a certain building type or style, and that's what I think the current graph goes um, emphasizes the it's an excellent example of warehouse architecture over time. Now I understand that another one of the criteria is that it's um, important as the work of a master or an architect. So that's what you believe will be submitted then will be based on Mr. Bradshaw and his body of work in this particular example of it. Do you think that President Bradshaw is a master? I think it's a local master, yes. I mean, you know, we have our national masters as a Frank Lloyd Wright and Richardson, but this is significant at the local level and each major city I believe has that's in criterion C or is that some other criteria? In criterion C. So if he's a master, you just don't think he's one of his master work? Well, I mean, that's the other dilemma we have. I mean, I a collection of buildings, whether it's all our public schools or all the work of an architecture, either you approach it as, you know, it's a collection, the total body is significant, and each one contributes to the total body of work. Or, particularly in the Uber and architect, some buildings are truly outstanding, and some are work that. Pedestrian. Are perfect. Are pedestrian. Oh, some pedestrian, yes. He has to fit in his work, but again, it's like the sort of individually eligible building and the security building. Yes, you know, we like to see it there, but it's not that type of thing.
just take a little longer than it's going to be. Well, I think, I mean, it is a difficult thing to wrestle with. Is it every building that uh, after a local architect uh, created, should that automatically be there? 